Hi everyone, this is Dr. Windsor. Thank you for joining the second half of the lecture on chapter three, The Surgical Patient. The remainder of the chapter focuses on the concepts associated with death and dying. So while death and dying is a normal part of the progression of life, it's not the most fun thing to talk about. However, a better understanding of these will help us hone our craft as caregivers. So first, let's talk about the three medically accepted stages of death. They are cardiac, higher brain, and whole brain. Cardiac death is defined as the irreversible loss of heart and lung function. Here, there is permanent loss of heartbeat and breathing. Now with higher brain death, we have irreversible loss of higher brain function, such as thinking, reasoning, speech, planning, judgment. The brain stem is still providing those autonomic or automatic activities, such as breathing, blood pressure, and heartbeat. Whole brain death is defined as the irreversible loss of all functions of the entire brain, including the brain stem, and it's referred to and accepted as legal death. So here we don't have any brain waves. The individual is unresponsive. There's lack of pupil reflexes and we have a decrease in body temperature. So as previously discussed, we want to be sensitive to any cultural or religious end of life practices or rituals. Well, let's talk about Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Now, Dr. Kubler-Ross spent most of her life studying individuals that were at the end of their lives. Through her studies, she identified five stages of grief, which include denial, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Oh, and anger is in there too, excuse me. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. So denial is an unwillingness to accept what's happening to the self. So a statement that could be denial would be, this can't be happening to me. Anger is where denial is replaced by feelings of rage, anger, envy, resentment, and so on. A statement might be, or a question might be, why is this happening to me if the person is in that anger stage? Now, bargaining is where the individual tries to postpone the inevitable, even if it's just in their mind. A statement might be, just let me live long enough to see my son graduate or something like that. Moving on to the fourth stage, which Dr. Kubler-Ross said is depression. That's where anger is replaced by a sense of loss. And the statement that a person might make that is in that depression stage could be, please don't take me away from my family. And then lastly, hopefully, the individual enters into the acceptance stage of grief where they finally accept the situation and they might say something like, I know I will be in a better place. Interestingly, uh, Dr. Dr. Kubler-Ross once suggested that each individual goes through every step of grief and they go through them in this specific order, starting with denial and, and eventually arriving at acceptance. Now, she was interviewed at the end of her life by Oprah, and she stated that that was not necessarily her personal experience, what she had discovered in her life work. <clears throat> Some days she said she accepted and welcomed death, and other days she was angry and in denial. So these kind of got shifted around. Some days she found herself bargaining. Other days she felt acceptance. Another day she might feel rage or denial. So this gave her a different perspective, and she speculated that perhaps the stages could be experienced out of order, or even some and not other stages, um, so that it might be unique to the person and not such a scripted process uh, of grief. 
So we talked about the stages of death and grief. Next, we're going to discuss the general categories of causes of death. There are four general causes of death, accidental, terminal, prolonged, and sudden. Accidental death can be caused by nature, like a flood or a tornado or a lightning strike, or it can be caused by humans, a motor vehicle accident, let's say. The search tech should be aware of the protocols for preserving evidence because they may need to do an investigation into what happened, and in that case, we need to preserve the evidence so that those can be looked at later on. The second cause, like I said, is terminal. This is when death is imminent, and typically we provide something called palliative care. Now, palliative care is not meant to cure or heal the individual. It's just designed to make them more comfortable at their end of life. Examples could be cancer or cirrhosis of the liver. We may do something in surgery like debulking a tumor, removing part of a tumor. The third uh, general cause of death is prolonged. It's also referred to as chronic. Now, this could be uh, a disease that is a uh, affecting the patient for four to six weeks, but typically it's a lifelong thing uh, that's going to require lifelong treatment. For example, asthma or high blood pressure. Those things typically persist throughout the rest of the individual's life. And lastly, sudden death. This is any death that occurs without warning, and some examples could be cardiac arrest or respiratory arrest or sudden infant death syndrome, SIDS. It's important to remember, again, I, I keep repeating myself, but that each of us have different values and morals, beliefs. These are guided by culture, religion, and our families, and this is what dictates how we would respond or how our patient would respond when faced with a death. Now, again, I talked about palliative uh, care. Remember, um, palliative care, the goal is not to treat, uh, to cure, but it's to alleviate discomfort, make the patient more comfortable. An example of palliative care might be we have a patient that is in end-stage liver disease and the um, they have some discomfort and so we might put in some sort of stent to relieve some pressure. But again, uh, it's the procedure is to help make the patient more comfortable, but it is not intended to cure. Therapeutic procedures, on the other hand, they can be elective or non-elective, and they are used to treat or manage disease. An example could be a placement of a stent or a pacemaker. It can also include living organ donations, all of which we could be helping with in the operating room. So let's talk a little bit about life support. What is life support? Life support is a set of therapies that preserve a patient's life when the body systems are not functioning sufficiently to sustain life. Some of those techniques could include feeding tubes, having an IV so that they can get different medications, mechanical respiration to help them breathe, something called total parenteral nutrition, or you might see it abbreviated as TPN. Now, TPN is nutrition that the patient is receiving IV, so it completely bypasses the digestive tract. All other therapies included in life support could be heart-lung bypass, defibrillation, urinary catheterization, and dialysis. Now, life support can be further divided into two categories, ordinary and extraordinary. Ordinary life support is used to prolong life that a physician is morally obligated to provide without placing an undue burden on the patient. 
Ordinary measures are those that are based on medication or treatments which are directly available and can be applied without incurring severe pain, cost, or other inconveniences, but which give the patient in question justified hope for a commensurate improvement in his or her health. Now let's talk about extraordinary. Extraordinary refers to therapies that may pose an undue burden on the patient and be costly or excessively risky or painful to the patient. We can say it another way. Extraordinary measures have benefits that do not outweigh the burdens on the patient. So next we're gonna talk about euthanasia. The term euthanasia comes from the Greek word meaning good health, and it's divided into two categories, passive and active. And I made this a little chart here so you could see that. Passive euthanasia means there is something that we could do to prolong this person's life, but we don't do it. So nothing is done to preserve life, and we just let them pass. Active euthanasia, on the other hand, is when an individual takes actions that speed up the dying process. There are also two different categories of active euthanasia, which include voluntary and involuntary. Voluntary means the patient initiates the facilitation of their own death, whereas involuntary, the patient's right to their life is violated. All right. Now, physician-assisted suicide is legal in 10 states, as well as the District of Columbia, D.C. States include California, Colorado, Hawaii, Montana, Maine, New Jersey, New Mexico, Oregon, Vermont, and Washington. Remember we talked about the AHA Patient Care Partnership a while ago, and just as a refresher, the Patient Care Partnership gives patients the right to refuse treatment or to direct their own care. Patients have a voice in their care. Now, the Patient Self-Determination Act of 1990 requires medical facilities to inform their patients of their right to choose the type and extent of their care, type and extent of care. It also requires that facilities provide patients with info concerning living wills and powers of attorney. We're going to talk about that next. So advanced directives, these are legal documents used to speak for patients in the event that they can't speak for themselves. And there are two types, the living well and the do not resuscitate, do not intubate order. A living will allows the patient to state in writing what interventions they are willing to endure to sustain life. A power of attorney allows an individual to legally appoint a healthcare proxy who can speak for them and make medical decisions for them in the event that they cannot. A DNR, or do not resuscitate, or DNI, do not intubate order, states the resuscitation should not be attempted if the patient suffers cardiac or respiratory arrest. Now, many hospitals resend, they withdraw, they do not honor the DNR, DNI order during surgery. So it's important that this is discussed as a team prior to surgery. Very important. Um, if a death does occur in the operating room, you need to follow the hospital guidelines. So that means you need to know what the hospital guidelines are. And the text provides some general rules for us to follow. The first one is somebody needs to notify the surgery department supervisor, and that might be the circulating nurse that you're working with. Uh, the surgeon is going to notice, notify the family 
and or significant others of the death. Also, religious leaders are notified as per family request. And if a homicide is expect, uh, suspected, remember, I mentioned we want to make sure that we preserve any evidence. There might be a bullet or something of that sort, a knife that we remove from the patient, foreign body. We may be responsible for helping prep the body for family viewing as well as helping with the post-mortem care prior to transport of the patient out of the operating room. And then the other thing kind of tied to this is, you know, it's hard when you have a patient die in the operating room and and as healthcare professionals, that can also impact us in a variety of ways. And so a lot of facilities have resources for you if you have experienced a death in the operating room. And a lot of them will have some sort of debriefing where you kind of get together as a team and you talk it out afterwards. I can remember my first death in the operating room. I had just taken a full-time scrub tech job at a hospital and I was still with my preceptor that trained me when I was in school and we had started taking I had started taking call with her and we get called in in the middle of the night for an um, a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm a triple a now statistics say that an individual that comes in with a ruptured AAA has a 5% chance of making it off the table. Now, I didn't know this at the time, of course, but we spent six hours working on this patient, trying to fix her ruptured aorta, sew in a graft. Um, she was a very elderly individual, I think in her 80s or so, and her tissues were really friable, which meant every time the surgeon tried to put in a stitch, it kind of pulled out. If you think about trying to put stitches in paper, it was kind of like that. And I was standing across the table from my preceptor, and at one point I saw one of the surgeons take the suction and stick it inside the patient's abdomen, and then they just stood there. Uh, the patient was just, the abdomen was filling up with blood, and they were just sucking all of her blood out, and they weren't doing anything at all. And I, it took a minute uh, for it to register in my brain what was going on. And I remember looking up at my preceptor, and I just saw this tear, like, slide down her cheek. And that's when it dawned on me that that patient wasn't going to come off the table alive. So she did end up passing away. Uh, the surgeons determined that there wasn't anything else that they could do for her. And uh, from our perspective, uh, the instrumentation was taken out of that. We had a retractor in the abdomen, so we took that stuff out. But we left the patient just as she was, the IV stayed in, all of those things. Uh, a lot of times this becomes what we call a coroner case, and the coroner has to be um, <clears throat> notified, <clears throat> sorry, that uh, there's been a death in the operating room, and then they, uh, a lot of times they will come into the operating room, they might ask you some questions, at least that was my experience uh, with my first death in the operating room. We didn't clean up the patient or anything like that. We just kind of stayed out of the operating room until the patient was finally out. And then we uh, cleaned up the operating room. So that was my experience with my first death in the operating room. Let's talk a little bit about organ transplantation. Now, under the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1986, hospitals have to establish organ procurement protocols or they lose Medicare and Medicaid funding. 
a patient is considered a candidate for what they call DCD, which is donation after cardiac death, if it's predicted that their heart will stop beating within 90 minutes of being removed from life support. Now, <clears throat> for patients who were not placed on or were not removed from life support and they are already legally dead, there are some tissues that we can still procure from them, and that includes corneas, skin, and bone. <clears throat> In most cases, there um, every state has uh, an organization, like there's the, the Arizona Donor Network here in Arizona, but they're the ones that facilitate those conversations with the families if somebody isn't already an organ donor. So um, my experience with this is, uh, and, and this could be true for you too once you get out there, that they do the procurements in the operating room. So there is a chance that you may be helping with organ procurements uh, in your career, my experience was there was a uh, call into the operating room, or um, I guess it was the, the OR lounge there, and it was somebody from the donor network saying we had a patient in our hospital that had um, passed away. She was in her 40s, she had a brain aneurysm, and she was an organ donor. So they were keeping her on life support, um, and, uh, they were looking for a nurse and a surgical tech to help with the procurement. Now, uh, we volunteered and they did the procurement in the middle of the night. We came back at about 1 a.m. to do the procurement and, uh, that was a really interesting experience. I, I didn't expect there to be so many individuals in the OR, but there were there was an individual to take the heart when we when we procured that a different individual that took the lungs uh, we didn't take bone or skin we took the kidneys we took lymph nodes those kinds of things um, and it was a really interesting experience and I guess it really didn't hit me until the anesthesia care provider turned off the machines. And we sucked all the fluid out of the patient's body. Um, we sewed her up and then we put uh, tied a toe tag on her toe and I helped them get her into the body bag and we put her on a gurney and we took her to the morgue. And it was shocking to me because our goal in the operating room is to save a life. And I know that this is a part of that process, but it was still, um, you know, it was hard to process that, um, that whole experience, but it was really awesome because later, a month or so later, I received a letter from the donor network um, saying uh, about the different organs and how they had helped other people or how they were used scientifically to do research and those kinds of things. And that was really amazing. It's, it's really um, unfortunate that a lot of people aren't organ donors and there are so many individuals waiting to get organs. One thing that is becoming more popular is live organ donations. So somebody that's alive will donate a kidney or bone marrow or a, a lobe of their liver or something of that sort. So you will um, definitely have the opportunity to help with some of those uh, procedures as well. So we learned several concepts related to the surgical patient in this chapter. So not only do you have a better understanding of patient responses to illness and hospitalization, you come away with a clearer picture of the physical, spiritual, and psychological needs of the patient. 
We also learned about the process of death and how cultural and religious beliefs and values influence the surgical patient. Wow, you really learned a lot. Great job. So this concludes the review of chapter three and the surgical patient. Thank you again so much for listening. I hope this contributed to your learning and understanding of the material. I'll see you next time.